Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very excited to speak to Jiang Lin Li about her book titled When the Iron Bird Flies, China's Secret War in Tibet, which has just been published in 2022 from Stanford University Press in English. Um, And this is really quite an interesting book because it looks at um, a really important episode in Chinese history, in Tibetan history, um, that we generally, a lot of us uh, in the West, in China, in Tibet, um, don't really know a lot about, which is what actually happened between 1956 and 1962 in the region of Tibet um, when the current Chinese government uh, gained, took control over it. So this is a really important book on a lot of levels. And Jiang Lin, I'm really pleased that you're with us on the podcast to tell us about it. Uh, Hello. Uh, Thanks for inviting me. Uh, this book, as you said, is about that specific period of time, and uh, it was originally published in Chinese, and uh, I'm glad that the English version is coming out, so we can understand more, um, and uh, more in detail, what happened during that time. To give us a background to our discussion about the book, could you introduce yourself a little bit and explain sort of how you came to write this book? Uh, I was born and uh, brought up in China. Uh, both of my, my parents are communists. Um, they, were, they used to be in the army and uh, they fought during, during the um, civil war. I mean, the communists and the uh, nationalists. So in a way, we call that a, a red family. And that was, of course, all everything I know about Chinese history and Tibetan history was a fixed uh, narrative from the um, CCP's historical books. I wasn't really know, I didn't know anything about um, Tibet when I was in China. The first Tibetan I actually met was in New York when I came out. But I survived the Cultural Revolution when uh, it lasted for 10 years. So that made me think about a lot of things um, which kind of went against the standard party narratives. Um, In early 1980s, there's a lot of historical facts about um, the Civil War, uh, anti Japanese wars, etc., came out, which kind of like shattered um, many of my belief. So eventually, I decided I need to, I want to find, I just want to find out what was. Um, the, so, the historical facts about the so-called Tibetan issue, why Tibetan became an issue, and what made it become an issue, what kind of issue it is. It's just that from here. I can see how that would be a big question that would um, lead to such a massive amount of work and research that went into um, both the Chinese language version of the book and, of course, this English version of the book. Um, And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of the differences between the two versions. Um, What is, you know, what has extended in this book compared to the earlier version? You know, the Chinese version was written for the Chinese audience. And um, my understanding uh, was when I was writing that book, that my Chinese audience would be the same as me. We, we, we all were brought up and uh, kind of like being taught about Tibet in a way um, like the way I grew up and Tibet was uh, backwards, barbarous, darkness and so on. Uh, but to convince the, uh, trying to convince the Chinese audience what the situation was, and what really happened is more difficult than the English audience. 
And um, that's why in the Chinese version, I had a lot of direct quotations from uh, secret documents, and the speeches, um, so on. Um, most of those quotations were taken out in English, in, in uh, the English translation this, in this process, because um, it's not only it's tedious, and then another thing is I don't really need to convince the English audience um, what, what the situation basically was. And all I need to do is um, kind of uh, like let people know what I, what I found out, like the statistics and the sources and uh, the process the com the compact the war in relatively more detail, and also in the English version was published like around ten years after the Chinese version. So during those ten years, I didn't stop the research. So there there were more sources coming out, especially um, the documents. More documents came uh, surfaced, and the more. Um, details are surfaced, and the, all the generation uh, that uh, cutters and the soldiers they participated in those events, kind of aging, and they are eager to write about their memoirs. And the, many of those memoirs came out, so I added a lot of those into the English version, which is not in the Chinese version. That makes a lot of sense. Um, 10 years is a long time for more to come out. And I'm glad you mentioned sources because um, I think one of the key reasons that so many people don't know about these events is that they're secret, is that the government doesn't talk about it. So how do we know about these things? What? How did you find these documents and get these sources? It's an interesting thing as in... It was all those documents were kept like secret for many years, um, starting from nineteen eighties. Something started to lose out a little bit, so something came out during that time, and uh, of course in nineteen eighties, well, I didn't pay any attention to this, but it was floating around and it got connect, uh, collected by um, other foreign libraries. And in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, uh, in India, and and also later, in in uh, later recent years, many of those um, collections of like document collections were collected in online databases for researchers, and people didn't really who put those. Um, documents into the database probably didn't really understand their importance to researchers. So many of them were, even though classified as a secret, was somehow got into those databases. And uh, I downloaded a lot in academic libraries in Hong Kong, in Taiwan. And so some of them, most of them were open, open pub publications, like in county and province this annuals and you just have to sort through tons of them and uh, pick out the information connect them together to it will come uh, you know the result is um, is a big picture it's right, quite clear right in front of you but it's just a lot of detailed work Hmm. And of course, I've been traveling to Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, India, and many of them were, uh, many of the documents also were collected in American libraries. Hmm. A lot of work, really a lot of work went into this to produce such a clear account. Um, and given how many documents you looked at and how long you've been doing this, um, was there any kind of moment in particular that was where you read something where you were really surprised? Like, whoa, I didn't expect to find that there or something like that um, that you could tell us about? Yeah, first of all, uh, I didn't expect what happened was uh, actually war. Because for years, uh, people understand this as 
uh, suppression of rebellion. That's the, the term used in Chinese, um, in, in China. And in outside China, people also use this, this term without actually understand what method was used to suppress the rebellion. And um, this is not uh, like a, a street fight, a street protest, and the government sent the policemen to crack down, uh, to shut down, something like that. It's actually the Chinese government used a very powerful military force, including air force, to fight um, Tibetans for six years. It is actually a war. And another thing was, um, why, that, why did Chinese government do this? That was a question when I was, I kept asking myself, it didn't make sense. They knew who, whom they were fighting for and why use such powerful military force? Why air, even Air Force? Until I found the mouse directives and to they, they take the opportunity to train the army in the actual war in, uh, in, on the plateau because that was the region China, the Han Chinese know nothing about. They knew, and uh, so it, when you think about only a few months, six, around six months after, after they stopped the war, or they, you can say they won the war in, um, in Tibet, fighting Tibetans, they immediately started war against the India, on the border conflict, or the official term. But by the time they started fighting India, all this set, um, logistics and racing and the experience is already there. So it served several purposes. And everything, they, it was a, quite a shock to me. It was hidden so deep. Well, I think that that's really important to understand kind of how buried it was um, and also sort of that the goals were a lot broader than kind of that term of putting down rebellion suggests. Um, so now that we have that overview, I'd love to kind of go to the beginning of this period, to 1956. Um, and can you help us understand why armed resistance broke out in the Tibetan plateau um, in this year? There was a time China started to push um, what they call democratic uh, democratic reform, which is actually uh, um, a series uh, for social engineering programs. It's a, the purpose was to completely destroy Tibetan's traditional social economic uh, system and replace it with with the Chinese system and political system, economic system, etc., and the ideological system. So that caused uh, this uh, this whole idea of a so-called democratic reform and the method, the methodologies used was completely against the uh, the Tibetan tradition. So this is a big clash. And um, um, Tibetan, it's, it doesn't start with like big scale. It was small scale and eventually escalated into a war. And why did the Chinese want to completely change the Tibetan system? That's based on the, the CCP's um, basic ideology. Because as Mao, I think Mao, Mao Zedong in his first uh, telegraph, um, I think it was sent from Moscow in January 1950. Uh, he, he made it very clear. Tibet, he, want, he, wants to, he wanted to occupy Tibet and then reform into a so-called People's Democratic Tibet, which means he, CCP not only wanted to occupy Tibet, it want, also wanted to change Tibet. And um, they, they don't, 
So the Tibet entire social situation and the social conditions and the social structure is completely different with the Han Chinese. The, so they use, so Mao insisted they want to do this. They are not going, I think uh, Zhou and I also mentioned that. Um, there's no way you can keep a different system in they call the surface system inside a socialist system. So they're going to change it sooner or later. And uh, when they when they signed the agreement, even though it mentioned in the 17 point agreement that they are not going to change it, but that's not really true. So this is another thing of st- uh, research about modern Tibet is when you see the, Ch- the CCP's documents, they usually say one thing, but in practice, they did another thing. You can't take the documents or something purely for the, for its face value. Hmm. Can you tell us more about the 17 points? Where did that kind of come from and what actually happened? Yeah, there's a lot of writings about uh, 17 points agreement. That, that, that was the thing is like um, during when in 19... 19, uh, 1950, in October 1950, there were two things happened in, in inside China. The same month, um, PRA, the Chinese uh, military, entered Korea and participated in the Korean War. At the same time, um, same month, they fought a war in, in Tibet, in Changzhou, and conquered uh, conquered Changzhou. And because the whole world was paid, paying attention to the Korean War, so much lesser attention was paid to what happened in Tibet. Um, so in this battle, uh, Chinese call it the Battle of Changdu, uh, Tibetan, the main force of Tibetan uh, Tibetan army was defeated. And that's um, uh, then Mao stopped that there. They didn't go right into uh, Tibet. Um, the reason was one thing: they didn't know what's inside of Tibet, and the second, they wanted to stop and see what the international reaction was. And of course, the international reaction is much more in focusing on the Korean War. So they stopped for a while. They decided to have an agreement with basically to sign a treaty with Tibet so they don't have to uh, f- fight an, a, a long war into it. So the, there's a lot of writings about uh, how this agreement was made. And t- at that time, Dalai Lama was on the border, ready to escape into, uh, into India. And eventually, <laughs> They signed the agreement, which actually, when in one of my interviews, Dalai Lama himself told me um, um, what the, uh, the seal they used was was not original seal. They, they just made a seal in in, in Beijing and and, and used this uh, used this uh, I think delegation's name. Uh, they made a seal and they used that. To, for agreement, and the agreement have seventeen like points. That's why it's called seventeen points agreement. And uh, I wouldn't go to detail because you can really find it easily find out in even in wiki. Uh, wiki. Um, mm-hmm. So in this way, um, the uh, Chinese army just entered Tibet and occupied Tibet. That's what I mean. It's the same to Tibet, today's uh, um, Tibet autonomous region. And the other part of Tibet, like Kang and Ando, that was occupied, occupied way before that. And politics is obviously one part of this, um, but you economic aspect is also a key part. Um, and if we know about sort of the CCP's history in the rest of China, obviously collectivization, land reform um, are things that are happening throughout the country. Um, what did land reform and collectivization look like during this takeover of the Tibetan region? In each, 
you know, Tibet, the three uh, different Tibet regions, Kang, Ando, and Central Tibet, it's different time and different different way of doing that. And it started with, uh, first in, actually it's in Yunnan, which is a part of Kang. And um, also Tibet has like different um, a different uh, economical system. Some uh, some of them are farmers, some of them are nomads, and um, in so they also did this in a different way. They started from agricultural regions, then uh, first, and then a couple of years later, they started in nomadic regions. This it is a particular. Th- it's particularly difficult for Tibetans because land is very scarce. Not that many land available to distribute. And um, and another thing is a lo- the monasteries owned a lot of land. So when you want to distribute the land, you have to take the land from the monasteries. And people didn't like that because of the traditionally traditionally um people you know traditionally let's say um monasteries monasteries serve a lot of different uh purposes and um, in difficult times um people really count on the monasteries for a lot of uh help and um this this many Many reasons that did um, cause the Tibetans resistance, but this is one of ma- one of the major reasons is, is um, the destruction of Tibetan Buddhism and the monastery. So, anyone who's um, been to the Tibetan region or um, to Tibet itself, and or has maybe seen pictures of Tibetan monasteries, they're they're quite large, right? And as you said, they own a lot of land. Um, so could you tell us about the Iron Bird from the title? How were these monasteries destroyed? Uh, yeah, I did quite a lot of research on on the destruction of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, it also started from different regions, uh, eventually pushed into central Tibet. Um, in regions like the Dalai Lama's birthplace, that was a mixed, uh, ethnic, ethnically mixed region. It started as early as 1953, but later on, in purely Tibetan, uh, Tibetan regions, which which means Tibetans were a majority of the population, it started in 1958. Um, some of them were destroyed during the war. They just like bombed it, and um, when. Traditionally, when something happened, Tibetans will escape into a uh, monastery. And um, and also, some monks also participated in the resistance. And there are many cases, especially in Qinghai and Sichuan, um, mon- the PRA just surrounded the re- uh, monastery and it became a, it became a, it became a, a battleground. Actually, and during the process, um, the monitors were destroyed. And later on, in 19, starting from 1958, um, CCP started a movement um, called um, Religious System Reform, which is also a part of the democratic reform. Uh, this, this movement just aimed at destroying Tibetan. Um, religion, and especially the monasteries. And during this process, um, majority, uh, more than 90% of Tibetan monasteries were either closed or reused as schools, office, um, uh, warehouses, etc. And monks were sent back uh, to their lay life, become the court the production power. So by the time during the Cultural Revolution, that time, it was Tibetan monasteries basically all gone. And I would like to point one point out one thing. Many people believe 
uh, Tibetan monasteries were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution, which is not really true. Majority of the monasteries were destroyed during this six years. And the Cultural Revolution was another wave of destruction. It basically destroyed whatever left after that. Hmm. And from a sort of military standpoint, can you tell us more about um, sort of what the military side of this actually looked like? Um, kind of what were the weapons used or tactics and kind of help us understand sort of what it would have been like on the ground, I suppose. On the battleground, yeah, I wrote several chapters about about the actual fighting and the statistics in the last chapter is all about statistics, including the PRA studies, how many how many troops used, uh, what uh, branches of the military used. Uh, what you can imagine in your mind, you can see is on the one side it's the tribal tribal people. Uh, on the other side was a formal military force, and especially the main force used during this war was the force that fought in Korean War. And the, this 50, 54th Army was called from Korea directly into Tibetan regions. In to start the, to start the training, then quickly send into Tibetan plateau in Qinghai to fight, and this army then in 1959 transferred to Central Tibet. So what they are on? So it's a totally asymmetry war. The Tibetans, not most of the Tibetans, got involved, caught in the battles, were not even fighting. Not even men. They didn't even, you know, the, the situation where you can picture in your mind was during that six years, Tibetans were escaping from everywhere. And the Qinghai, from Qinghai, from Sichuan, they, they tried to escape into central Tibet. When they, some of them um, got into central Tibet and then they found out central Tibet also was a war zone. So they tried to escape to India. And during this time, they were caught um, by cavalry, PRA cavalry or Air Force. And the Air Force just bombed them. Mm -hmm. Whatever they seen, when, when they saw tents, um, on the, uh, uh, like a group of tents on the plateau, they just bombed them. They didn't care who they were. And um, so, it was very hard. It's not a war between two um, formal military military forces. It's just one side of militia the most, and uh, with with women, children, monks, elderly, so on, all mixed together. On the other side was a formal military force fighting. And that was that, that was the reason why Tibetans has such a horrible casualty number. It's nearly nearly twenty percent of the population at that time was involved into in the actual battleground. I'd love to go back to a point that you made earlier about the impact of Mao's directives. Um because from what you've just said, um Perhaps one question could be, well, if one side is a military and the other side is militia, but also lots of civilians, non-combatants all mixed up, um, you know, why was the war, why did it last six years? Maybe the assumption would be that it would be less time than that. Um, and earlier you mentioned the impact of Mao's directives. Um, so I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit more about them and what kind of the outcomes were of him issuing these orders. Yeah, in 1959, uh, uh, Mao had, in early 1959, Mao had three uh, telegraphs to Tibet Work Committee. Basically, he was saying, um, this war is good. He Actually, he used the term war. Um, the war is good. It's, um, 
it gave us opportunity to to train the army and train the people. And uh, we can just keep fighting that for five or six years or seven, even seven and eight years. So then that will clear the way for um, democratic reform. Um, why was, so <laughs> let me get back to this. And so this effectively Mao gave a green light for the army to do whatever they want to do. Right? It's good. It, in, because of this, they had no hesitation killing anyone. And um, they all they want to, all they, they, they consider, they just see anyone as um, what they called the, the term they used was uh, rebel bandits. And uh, when they see a group of those people, they just, they just shoot, they just bomb. Um, so why it took so long? Because Tibet, traditional Tibet was very large. Uh, if we consider um, Kang, Ando, and uh, Central Tibet, it, it, was, it is like uh, one-fourth of a Chinese, the total Chinese um, territory inside China now. So it was a large area. And, the, and it's high, eleva- elevation is quite high. And the people, it's bit, the Han people really didn't know anything about this region. And the military had no experience in this region. It, they conquer, the term they use is they conquer one place um, at a time. And then whatever region they, they conquered, they started uh, the reform immediately in that region. So it's a slowly, slowly, slowly one place at a time. And the army was sent from, from one place and another. That, that's the reason it took so long. They just don't, they couldn't even had enough military to go all at once. And don't forget at that time in 1958, there was a time have, uh, it was also a time they had bombing of uh, in, in the island in Taiwan. So they had a kind of like a war military action in the East and another military action in the West. And also that was that was also the time when China had the great farming. So a lot of factors put together. Um, I think that that's really helpful in placing this in context, um, but also understanding the intensity of it, right, with so many Tibetans being impacted. Um, you spoke earlier about kind of the different audiences of the book, the Chinese audiences, what they already might, what they might already know, and what they bring to the book from that, um, versus uh, English speaking or English reading audiences. Um, is there anything in addition about the book that you think is really important for particularly English reading audiences to know? I would think um, the English audience. I would hope they pay. More attention to the details. Um, I tried to sort out all the details I can find and um, picture a much bigger picture. Um, see, the last last chapter of this book is like uh, it's all collections of statistics from all sources, Chinese sources. What happened at that time? How Tibet became an issue? We always call say Tibet issue, but what is really a Tibet issue, and why Tibet became an issue, and what kind of issue it is? When you go through these details, you will have much better understanding why Tibetans continue to fight to resist. From even though Dalai Lama has left uh, Tibet for more than sixty years, but several generations of Tibetans. We're still fighting and still resisting Chinese occupation. And this has a lot to do with what China did, what the CCP did in Tibet. Um, when you say how many Tibetans were in, impacted by this, I would say everyone, in one way or another. You were either being 
uh, trained as activists and uh, pushed forward to persecute um, your own people, your own monks. And um, or you were caught in you you were caught in the um, battlefield try, when you are trying to escape, or you became an uh, exile. You became exiles in foreign land, or you you were like some of them being used as uh, uh, being used as like models and being used as a uh, um, what was the term? Uh, United Front uh, targets and being treated well, but you have to be a mouthpiece for the for for the government. One way or another, you were caught in this turmoil, and um, you have no escape. That was the reason when I write about this book. I try to write the stories of the ordinary people, the nomads, the monks, um, the people who live in the remote part of Tibet or, and also remote part of China. People didn't know the, the, that region existed. People didn't know, many of the Chinese didn't know those people, how they lived, what was their life before, what was their life after, and how they were, how they were caught in those events and which completely changed their lives, so on. It's a Tibetan issue. It's not only an issue of a group of elites, uh, officials, or not even only an issue about Dalai Lama himself. It's about the everyone of Tibetan people hmm. and their, their fate. Hmm. And this is... A, one of the major, a big part of my writing and my research process. So I interviewed many Tibetans, different levels, from officials to just nomads and monks, how they, how they fared in this historical events. Is there maybe one or two of those stories you could share with us now? Yeah, the book, which really in... in Deeply affected me actually is this uh, old lady. I in the book I call I wrote her, I call her uh, Amazoga. I interviewed her in um, in India, and a few years, a few years, couple of years after this, actually the same year when this book was published, I went to China for the last time, and after that, that was. Exactly, uh, about ten years ago, and that was the last time I was allowed to enter China. And after that, I was banned. Um, so I went to um, Tibet, which isn't Tibet, I would, would say, because I wasn't allowed to go to Central Tibet either. You mean if I was uh, at the time when I was allowed to go to China? Um, I visited that region and the visit Dalai Lama's birthplace. And on this, during this trip, accidentally, I went to um, a, a small village, just past that small village. It turned out to be Amazoga's hometown. That was where she escaped from. It was such a small place, middle of nowhere. I didn't even know when I uh, know about this when I passed by when I saw the roadside sign I was screaming I was like wow this is Amazoga's um, village and I could hardly imagine how she as a young woman escaped into from that place into central Tibet into Lhasa and then from Lhasa went by herself into India and she told me her life story. I still remember her. As she, she's just like always in my mind when I talk about when people ask me about that region. She was, she, you know, she had big, this writing this about her had a big impact on myself. You know, her, her courage, her determination, and it's hard to 
from the be- I was like able to see her follow her route. It's like from that small remote region, a, a village, all the way into India. It was completely life story. Hmm. Very impactful. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us and for sharing um, the insights uh, and importance of the book. I think it will be of interest to a lot of people um, because this is such a uh, thing that has been hidden for, I think, uh, many people for many decades. Um, and this book oh, does go through so much information and piece it all together to get that bigger picture. So thank you for sharing your time and expertise um, with us on the podcast. As a reminder to our listeners, the book is titled When the Iron Bird Flies, China's Secret War in Tibet. Um, And the English version is just out in 2022 from Stanford University Press. Jiang Lin Li, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me.